He has been named one of Africa's 10 youngest power men by Forbes magazine and selected as a young global leader by the World Economic Forum. The Harvard Business School graduate Yuvan Naidu has made a substantial name for himself in the world of finance, investment and risk and he's currently holding the position of partner and managing director of the Boston Consulting Group office here in Johannesburg. Yuvan has occupied a number of senior positions in both local and international banking industries that have seen him steer developmental growth and investment for the continent. So, he's better placed to tell us about the influence that the different international bodies such as BRICS, IMF, G20 have on the South African economy. Yuvan joins us on the show. Pleasure to catch up with you, Yuvan. Always a great pleasure. Much appreciated and congrats on your new position as a managing partner of Boston Consulting Group. Thank you. Now, BRICS has just met recently and there's the business part of it and there's talk about an investment rating agency that is separate and independent from the ones that we are familiar with that they want to establish that. Do you think it will fly given the current situation we find ourselves with in at this time? Because in a month or two, We'll be waiting for our report card, which has its own consequences for us, or implications at least. Well, the context of BRICS is quite important. And remember, when this union came about, it originally emanated out of the BRICS acronym from the famous Goldman Sachs report. Mm. Um, Brazil, Russia, India, China. And at that point, there was a small s added mm. to the end, mm. because as an economy, we are smaller. Mm but we represented a very important move in South Africa, Southern Africa, SADC. Mm. So South Africa very deserving, in my opinion, of its position from this part of the world. But that was during the commodity super cycle. Mm. And a lot of these economies, particularly Brazil, South Africa, were driven by that. So BRICS certainly had its day in the sun. In this economy, with the challenges, particularly with commodity prices under pressure, the sheen has been taken off the growth story that exists within BRICS. Mm. China, uh, whose growth is just sub 7%, which may be large for a number of countries, but for China, that certainly is a, a medium pace. Uh, India is certainly doing uh, well amongst the group, but Russia, uh, China, South Africa, going through uh, uh, the pains of the current global uh, uh, challenges that are taking place. So this question of where does BRICS stand vis-a-vis -vis this new context is very much about a sense of cohesion. There's a number of uh, uh, strong points that can be taken out of it, but it all depends on the actors, the common uh, 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 goals that each of them have, and how this manifests. And I think the magic word in today's economy is the time for talk is over, how do we implement and execute? So to your question on a ratings agency, it's clearly an interesting one particularly as rating agencies are going about the, the, the traditional ones, talking uh, about the ratings of Brazil, uh, of Russia, and certainly South Africa is under the scope. And I think the goal or the, the, the theory behind a BRICS rating agency is to provide an alternative uh, uh, voice, an alternative uh, lens, particularly to emerging markets. Well. We hope that maybe that will happen. But Brazil, for instance, uh, is having much more serious problems than we are having now. Sure. They've just removed their pre president via an impeachment. And I suspect the new government may probably not be that positively disposed to the BRICS idea as the previous government of, uh, of, of Brazil, for instance. And of course, the economic performance of the country itself is what? Is junk status now in terms of the ratings? compared to where South it's Africa sub -investment is. sub-investment grade, correct. Yeah, yeah. So, so, you know, the, what, what does that mean? If you have those types of problems, and we are also very apprehensive about the kind of rating we might get in the next few weeks. So, thinking, thinking, thinking through the principles of what's at play, and we've got to separate uh, uh, the kind of general move of the world to the specific actions of BRICS. There clearly has been a move, particularly for the South, to have a, a greater voice in its own destiny. So the impetus of this is, is possibly beyond just BRICS countries, mm. is can there be alternative voices? And there is no right and wrong. I yes. think the traditional consensus is, is there a way through the traditional rating agencies sure. for, more, uh, you know, for, for more of the voices to come in, and particularly in the big development banks versus this alternative movement? And again, a lot has to do with ex execution. Certainly in the discussions I've had with some of the leaders involved in the process, I think the real, the real issue when the rubber hits the road is that if a rating is provided for a particular bond issuance 
or for a, a, a particular uh, uh, event or instance. How seriously is that taken? And I think the first step is, does the BRICS bank itself make decisions based on these ratings? And do these ratings allow players from the South, globally, internationally, public, private sector, to actually make decisions. Mm. So I think the principles mm. will be quite important. Mm. And it's interesting, there's some interesting signals. It has to be independent, it has to be provided with the right expertise, because credibility is everything in ratings. And I suppose, you know, the, the institutions that may want to invest in these economies that come, let's say, from China or Russia or anywhere else, may look at uh, different attributes than the ones that are US-based or European oriented in their thinking. I suspect that could be the reason. I think, I think there's, it's a, it's, there's a lot in that question, right? And I think the first is that, um, number one, we've had this debate in South Africa regarding uh, you know, the role of international investors, the role of international rating agencies. You know, as someone who's born in South Africa, who spent their life working as a, as a pan-Africanist across countries, I think it is very important for us to have the self-awareness of how we position ourselves as investment destinations. It is critical to be able to work with the international community. That is not moving away from the fact that we have to find our own ways and make sure that our voices are heard through uh, institutions and channels, but it is fundamental to be able to understand uh, uh, you know, what these international lenses I, I are. Want, I want to bring the story closer to us here sure. at home, as well as the continent. And you're correct in saying what you've just said. You are now managing partner of the Boston Consulting Managing Group. director in the Johannesburg he, office. Right. Now, just briefly tell me about the nature of the work of your, of your organization before I talk about the report that you produced. So the Boston Consulting Group uh, is, is um, you know, you know, has 80 offices in approximately 40 countries and really is a strategic consulting house that partners with leading governments, public and private sector institutions, development finance group, groups to uh, help them in their next growth phase, in their next strategies and in their implementation of their plans. It really is a gathering of uh, some of the leading minds to come together to find solutions. And so in Africa, we currently have offices in Johannesburg, uh, offices in Lagos, we have an office in Angola and in Morocco. Mm -hmm. And through that, uh, you know, work with, with, with the leading players in each of those uh, countries and as well across the region. And part of the challenge, uh, be it public or private sector, is really several fold at the moment. Number one, businesses are seeking their next platforms of growth, their next platforms of execution. And so we are the partners to help them think through that to generate those successes. And a lot of the public sector is really about creating uh, uh, opportunities for their populations uh, and for their people. And so with that, you know, in South Africa, we've released a report for priorities for mm. South Africa, mm. and that's very much in keeping with the themes of our work. Well, I like the report. It says uh, four priorities requiring leadership for South Africa's future. Let's mention those priorities. And then I want to underline leadership. Right? Because that's what the report says, or it's, uh, it's the title of the report. Absolutely. So the key elements of the report really focus uh, around uh, health, around uh, education. Um, there's an element of infrastructure and also solving the employment uh, problems mm. Uh, mm. Um, I I in the country. And really four foundational, uh, uh, you know, pivot points that are fundamental to our future. Uh, and across all of these, uh, thinking through the issues of leadership, but also some practical solutions. So education, as an example, it, it focuses on the challenges that our students from primary school, secondary school, up into high school uh, and university face. Uh, basic issues like numeracy and core skills. So support for students, support for, for teachers, addressing the dropout rate that uh, takes place, and really equipping uh, a new generation of South Africans through vocational training schools to go forward. It really is a roadmap to address some of, the, some of the challenges. Well, those are the four key elements that need to be addressed, and education definitely at the center, with the high unemployment rate, especially amongst the youth. What kind of leadership is required to manage the situation that we find ourselves in now, with the universities being in turmoil, for instance, and a high unemployment rate, that's a given, and it's been there for a long time, 3.5 million young people, I'm told, between 18 and 25, not receiving education, no training, no employment, universities in turmoil, sure. and the basic education system itself having so many problems. Money is there, 
but somehow we're not making any difference. So being a fairly young democracy, relatively young democracy, these are problems that are going to be part of our challenge and growth for, for decades to come. How we address them now is going to be fundamental towards this. But let's again place that in context. We oftentimes in South Africa look at our problems and we have them as a growing democracy in isolation. This challenge of health and of education is a challenge that's faced in a number of countries, mm -hmm. from China to our neighbors in Africa, including the United States, which is seen as a first world country and, 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 and a leader in many of these things. There's an infrastructure problem. There's challenges with education. There's challenges with healthcare, and we see those debates. But from a South African perspective, I think it's absolutely fundamental to tackle these problems head on. I think the first challenge that we have to have is to stop the blame game. There's enough blame to go around. We can blame the past, and it is a significant role. We all grew up through that system and are still facing those challenges. Public sector, private sector, development finance institutions. I think the realization is that all of us are in this together. That's the first thing. I think the second is that students have always had a powerful voice in South Africa, and it's critical to listen to them. So in that mix lies the solution. And again, I will share some personal perspectives. I think it's very important, number one, uh, uh, for the private sector to realize a role in the South African ecosystem, be it apprenticeships, be it getting more involved, of personal accountability, not just as companies, but certainly as the citizens within those companies to understand that the ecosystem of South Africa is not an us or a them. Mm. This challenges the very fabric, the ability to do business, the ability to, and so this link between business and this problem has to strengthen, and you can see that that, that gauntlet has been taken up. Mm. You've got the likes of Cascovadia and the Banking Association and other private sector leaders coming to the table to say, how can we solve this problem? So I think that's the starting point. I think the second regarding the issue of funding, um, again, a, you know, a personal opinion. This has been a debate ever since the, 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 the ni early 90s when we were at university uh, and, and fighting it, the ability to afford students uh, uh, um, you know, the right. And I think thinking through those finances and economy becomes an intrinsic element. And if I can be very brief, number one, Growth will be very important as a growth engine to South Africa to generate the revenues, to make it conducive to be able to fund not just education, but uh, 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 um, health, uh, uh, jobs, etc. Number two, creating an ecosystem in which business is able to thrive and survive as one of the leading generators of the revenue is absolutely important. So there's a chicken and egg situation. How do we create this environment for businesses to thrive for businesses to be comfortable in, in forming these links, be it through vocational programs, and also boost the South African economy. All right, Yuvin, thank you very much. And of course, we could have pursued some of the time uh, limitations, yeah, sure. unfortunately. Basically, we need to be business-minded at the end of the day if we are going to solve any problem that confronts us. Well, it is not a business or a public sector solution. Yes. Both. P the public sector sets the rules of the game, the ecosystem in which society can thrive, and it needs enlightened leadership on both ends uh, for these solutions to be done. That's Yuvin Naidu of the Boston Consulting Group, who's been our guest here, and we're talking about ideas that can help South Africa move forward in the context of the world that is experiencing its own challenges, and let's not forget that. We invite you to share your thoughts on these issues and others. The address is tonight at modise.tv, and uh, remember to like us on our Facebook page, Tonight with Tim Modise.